Um, I am John Harmon. I think I know most of you at least. Um, I am the community manager, director. Uh, I'm not sure about my title yet here at R4DS. Um, and I am uh, writing a book about um, working with APIs from R. And this project, uh, this is the R4DS Project Club, by the way. And the idea of the Project Club is every month someone can come in and kind of present about something, whatever it is that you're kind of passionate about or you're working on or whatever, and get feedback from the community. So I am using this slot this month uh, to try to um, get some feedback about what I'm working on. So yeah, I'm writing this book. Uh, in theory, I'll finish it next year. Um, and it's uh, going to be published by CRC Press as part of the um, the R series. Um, but more, I'm writing it to uh, kind of really create a resource that I wish existed. And so I'm, it's taking a lot of uh, research to make sure I understand everything. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to uh, go ahead and present where that is right now. Uh, and so I do have some learning objectives and I'm going to just, okay, I'm just making sure that my windows are showing the right thing. Uh, there they go, okay. So today I'm going to try to convince you that you care about APIs. Chances are you do, cause you're here, but still uh, we're gonna talk about that a little bit here, or at least you're interested in the idea. Uh, I'm going to explain why I'm writing my book backward and what it means to write a book backward. Um, I'm going to try to recruit you to uh, cohort zero of my book club and then give you a sneak peek at a new book club site format that I'm working on. Um, <laughs> well, I, I have succeeded at my third learning objective uh, for at least one person. All right. And so, yeah, for that last one, uh, you'll have to stick around to the end to see that last one. So that's kind of a uh, clickbait learning objective. Um, we will see how that goes. All right. So for starters, why should you care about APIs? Well, first, um, you know, I want to explain what an API is. And to do that, I'm going to flip over to the first um, like real chapter of my book. There will be a chapter or two before this, but this is where we really start getting into the meat of the, the material. And we're going to go through uh, just the first like two sections of that and then come back to this presentation. So make sure, yes, that flipped over and uh, I need to pull up my notes for that one. So, all right. So this chapter, currently it's chapter two, uh, how do computers communicate? Um, so this chapter has uh, what six learning objectives. We're gonna go through the first two uh, here and then Maybe we'll come back if, uh, depending on what time looks like, but we'll start with these first two. So I want to um, get you to where you will be able to explain what an API is and then recognize examples of web APIs. All right. So for starters, an API is an application programming interface. Um, you almost never actually see that abbreviation spelled out. Everyone just calls them APIs. Uh, but in that abbreviation, Application means a function or a website or pretty much any computerized thing. Um, programming is means that it can be used in code. And interface is just a way to interact with or talk to something. So APIs allow computers to talk to one another. Um, but in this book, we're gonna be talking about web APIs. And this is uh, just an example of why it's important to distinguish that or differentiate that. This is from the um, HTTR2, or apparently it's actually pronounced hitter2 uh, package um, documentation. This is like the first paragraph right at the top of, of the uh, package website. It says hitter2 is a ground up rewrite of hitter that provides a pipeable API with an explicit request object that solves more problems felt by packages that wrap APIs. And in that paragraph, API kind of means two different things there or two related things. So technically any functions list of arguments or I guess the function itself is an API. Uh, but here we're talking about web APIs, the second API in that sentence. 
uh, a web API is an API on the internet, basically. And uh, for the rest of this book and uh, this presentation, um, API is going to mean web API, um, unless I say otherwise, but I don't think I ever switch back. All right. So some examples of web APIs. Um, first off, there's this website, apis.guru. It's a directory of APIs. There are actually um, several directories of APIs on the internet, but this is the one that feels the easiest to use to me, at least for my purposes. Uh, it has about 2,500 APIs as of a few days ago when I was putting these notes together. Um, and you can just search for an API. It also has an API. Um, and I have started to wrap that API into a package, APIs Guru. So just all one word, APIs Guru, um, which is on my personal uh, LinkedIn. I mean, not LinkedIn, uh, GitHub. I will link to that in a second. Um, actually, I'll go ahead and take that out. So it it's, should be at... Um, or, uh, that and if that link doesn't work i apologize <laughs> um so yeah that is a package i'm working on it's not done yet but it's, i'm using it as one of the examples in another project that i'm doing um of kind of auto generating packages for apis so that one is one of my test cases um but the the first apis i worked with uh were cloud services so um, pause is a package for, it's the uh, package for the Amazon Web Services. So P-A-W-S, um, it wraps all of the Amazon Web Services. Uh, there are also a separate like family of Amazon Web Services packages and actually maintain one of them, but pause is uh, auto-generated. And so it's pretty much always up to date, no matter what they do with the, uh, the the APIs on Amazon. Amazon's always adding new services or tweaking how things work and pause mostly automatically stays up to date. So uh, that's a good package for that. Um, a, uh, a guy named uh, Mark Edmondson has a whole family of packages around Google Cloud Services. So there's Google Analytics R and a whole bunch of other ones um, that you can find kind of via one another uh, those ones for access, accessing Google Cloud Services. And then there's uh, Azure R from the Azure team. There's a whole like group of packages there for uh, the Microsoft Cloud Services. Um, there's also, um, was it Analog C is for DigitalOcean. Uh, there are a few other, like there are other cloud services and pretty much, or not, eh, the cloud services probably pretty much all have an associated package that deals with their API. Yeah. Um, government agencies also tend to have APIs, especially uh, since the Obama administration, because they did a lot to work with opening up data from government. And so, for example, OpenFEC, there's a link in these slides, is the Federal Elections Commission uh, AP, API. I'm also wrapping that one into a package as part of my uh, stuff that I'm using for testing purposes. So that one will have a package soonish. Um, but pretty much every government agency has at least one API um, and that's US government, but actually like the Indian government has a whole lot of APIs. Um, you are unmuted, Kevin. I don't know if you mean to me, mean to be. Sorry, sorry, just yeah, to, no problem. I'll just say. <laughs> no problem. Um, uh, but lots, anyway, lots of governments have uh, APIs. And there will be a lot more to come in what is currently chapter seven of the book, How Can I Find APIs? Um, in part, there are lots of, there are ways to find um, packages that wrap APIs. There are some tips that I have uh, that will go in there and um, also packages to like deal with accessing APIs. All right, and at that this point, I'm going to flip back to the other notes and... Um, open it up. So, uh, do you, if you know, is there something that you want to do with APIs or that you have done with APIs um, that you are interested in learning more about? Go ahead. If so, uh, you can speak up 
in, you know, come off mute and say, or uh, put it in chat either way. I'm interested to hear if people have any examples. Yeah. Alan. Sure, go ahead. Um, so in my research, um, uh, we work a lot with like mobile phones. And one thing that uh, is really interesting is how like we use like motion, like accelerometers, like I'm actually working on an accelerometer right now. Um, and we sometimes want to like have moments where we could like talk to a database that might have like a model or something and then predict like, for example, the exact like activity that the person is doing based on the accelerometer. So if there was a model that was like just taking the accelerometer and being like step count or like whatever, it would then talk to like the service running on um, someone's, you know, cloud or like in our servers. Gotcha. So you would be publishing the API? Is that the angle that you're going from? Yeah. So it would be open to, so that the, so that the phone itself can like send the accelerometer data, stream it like directly to this model. And then like every, you know, 10 seconds yep. or something, we get some prediction of like, is this person walking or is this person sitting or something like that? Okay. Yeah. So I guess I should have included a slide in here that there are two um, main sections of the book and thinking about having a third one that's just kind of a bunch of recipes but the first two are uh, accessing apis so that'll be mostly about the hitter two package for reading data from apis and then publishing apis uh, which is mostly the plumber package um, if you're working from r but both of those will be covered and also some other things uh tangential to those two but those are the two main ones. So yeah, that that sounds excellent. Um, there's a lot in the chat about Google APIs. For example, YouTube, uh, Kevin and I actually have uh, done a lot of work on. So there is, there's a CRAN YouTube package, but it focuses on the data side of the YouTube API, the, the reading and um, for R4DS, like this video that we are recording right now will be posted. And um, I post those mostly automatically using the YouTube package, YouTube bar package that uh, Kevin started and helped him kind of finish. It's not really finished, but it's finished enough for us to use um, and it works. And so that is al also one of my examples that I'm gonna be updating with the other project that I'm doing to kind of auto-generate APIs or API packages. Um, there's also examples, just the, the general idea of data, um, lots of, yes. So a lot of times, um, and yes, Kevin needs to get back to the YouTube package and get started on those issues. Just hold off for about, uh, I don't know, until, until the new year, because I've got some stuff coming to make it much easier. Um, but yeah, lots of data access. Uh, I had, let's see, I have got a couple of examples here. Um, that, oh yeah, anytime that you have like, you know, log in with Google or log in with Apple, log in with Facebook, those are hitting an API. Uh, and so that's an example that you probably use almost every day. Uh, Slack API uh, is something that we've worked with a lot for R4DS um, also. So whenever you see the YouTube videos get posted on Slack, that's happening via the uh, R4DS Slack or the, the uh, Slack API package that I've helped with. Um, I did a talk a while ago for um, Our Lady's Rome. Uh, thank you, Federica. And I was talking about APIs. Oh, wait, no, that one wasn't APIs. I'm sorry. I did two different talks about the same time. That one was time zones. Uh, but the API talk I did a while back that I can't remember now who it was for um, was about there uh, just APIs in general, but there is a website where you can give it latitude, longitude, and uh, date. And it'll tell you when sunrise was, when was or will be uh, sunset. Um, and then all the other things that are around there, like twilight, civil twilight, nautical twilight, all these different terms. Um, and I used that just as an example to enhance a Tidy Tuesday data set that had um, UFO sightings and to tag them with, did they happen at night? Did they happen, you know, at dusk, at dawn, or 
during daylight because that kind of differentiates what what do you think it really was. Um, and so that's just an example of something you can do with APIs. Um, that package, uh, Apis Guru that I'm working on, uh, has a function list APIs that will make a tibble of APIs for you. Um, and oh, and yeah, I had code here in case we didn't have any examples just to, um, if you uh, want to play with that package, you can grab a sample <laughs> of APIs with that code once you've installed the package. All right, um, cool. So next, the next thing I wanted to try to cover is um, why am I writing my book backwards? So um, the idea of backward design and differentiating it from forward design comes from this book, Understanding by Design by Grant Wiggins and Jay McTie from 1998. Um, the general idea is like when you're designing a lesson, this was aimed mostly at um, teachers, um, mostly. But the forward design is like the typical way that people think of things is you like plan out your lesson about what you're, you know, what you're gonna teach. Uh, then you create some sort of assessment to measure whether your students actually absorbed what you taught them. And then you use that assessment to identify what your what the learners know. What did they take away from the lesson? And the idea of backwards design is uh, start at the end. So start with what the, finding out what the learners like need to know, like identify that, list that first. Uh, that's why uh, I encourage in our slides, and I did so a couple of times here, that the first thing I focus on is learning objectives. What is it that we're trying to take away from this material? Uh, so after you have that, and I'll talk a lot more about that, but so after you have that, um, then you create some sort of assessment or at least kind of the idea of assessment, some, some, some questions of how would you measure whether you have succeeded at that thing, uh, teaching that thing. And then finally, once you have those questions and those uh, like learning objectives, then you can plan your lessons in order to help the learners succeed at the assessment. And so what that means here, um, well, I'm gonna have another slide to uh, go into that a little bit more detail, but um, just to give some examples of this. So if you are a teacher who like, uh, you're just choosing a book to read and you talk about the book, you do all this stuff with the book, and then you test, okay, what did students remember? And that's how you know what they learned. That is a common way of developing a plan. Like, oh, we've got to read Romeo and Juliet this year. So that is what you start from. You don't start from, okay, but what do your students actually need to know uh, from that? So that's the reversal uh, forward backward. Um, this is also the backward design is also sometimes called like learner centered design or learner focused design um, because backward sounds like it's wrong, but uh, it's it's more focused on what are they trying to learn. Um, and oh, there is some nuance in this because, you know, this, if you do this wrong, that's where you get the idea of teaching the test. Um, and that's not what you want. You want to help learners succeed at like any assessment in this area, not just the specific one that you crafted. So that's something to be careful of there. All right, so how this applies to my book is uh, step one is to make a rough draft of slides just because I need something to discuss. Um, I actually have done this uh, for every chapter asterisk because as I was writing those chapters, making those slides, I found some things that I was like, oh, I should do a chapter on this. And so there's one or two chapters that do not have slides, but uh, most chapters do now have uh, these, you know, decks like uh, like what I'm showing and what I showed in a minute ago. Um, step two, discuss material with learners to identify what they need to know. I'm doing that right now. Uh, and let's see the next, uh, the next slide. Uh, for some more details about how I want to do that, but I'm doing that a little bit right now. Um, step three, maybe create an assessment. I don't know if I'm gonna like really formally do that, but I'll probably write up some like end of section exercises based on those learning objectives. So what would I put in the book as just some check yourself questions? 
Um, and I, I am going to try to get myself to actually do that before I write the material because it does help guide the material. Uh, um, in an ideal universe, I would repeat this process uh, multiple times. I will um, at least revise the learning objectives at this point. Uh, and But I doubt I'll get to do a full second book club before actually writing the book. Um, but then at that point, I will actually write the chapters. So once I have slides that have been revised, I've got some questions about what, uh, you know, check yourself types of questions. Did you actually learn the material? Then I'm going to write the material, write the chapter. Um, there's no solid completion date yet, uh, kind of obviously, based on, um, depends on how all this process goes, but I'm hoping to do this first book club um, like right away in the new year and then get a first draft of the book uh, by the end of next year, let's put it that way. Uh, we'll see if I can accelerate that at all. All right, so uh, do you want to learn about uh, web APIs with R? Uh, if so, um, you can come to r4ds.io slash book clubber, book name equals web APIs with R, or you can just go to r4ds.io slash book clubber and then choose web APIs with R in the dropdown. Um, to be clear, there won't be a book for you to read. Uh, it will be come to the meeting each week. It's very different from a normal book club in that, you know, first thing we always say is you should present the chapter. You should lead the discussion. That's the best way to learn. Well, you can't because uh, chapter doesn't exist. So I will be leading those discussions every week. Uh, makes it easier as a book club probably, but um, yeah, it won't exist. I'll, I'll be leading the discussion and, but I do want you to show up. Like I'll, I'll have the slides that you can read through before we have the discussion. And the idea will really be to show up and say, okay, what did you, you know, what didn't I cover that you, I, you wish I'd covered in this? Um, is there anything that I covered that you're like this, who cares? Um, that kind of thing. So I want it to be quite a discussion. Um, I think it we, or it can be weekly if people are up for that, because like I said, I made the first uh, set of slides for everything already. So I'm ready to go. Um, and so uh, that is something I do want to hear. If people don't want to do weekly, then, you mm -hmm. know, we can do monthly. We could do uh, every other week, whatever people or whatever works for people. Um, and just a note, when you go to sign up for Book Clubber, I discovered that uh, the shading doesn't always update right now. I've got some caching issues that I need to deal with. And so if you go there and the, it's all white, that doesn't mean nobody else has signed up. That means it hasn't uh, done a reset on the cache recently. Um, and also if you like reload and it doesn't load in your, um, your times, it doesn't mean they didn't save. It means that it hasn't loaded them back after saving them. And hopefully in the next day or two, I will fix that. Oh, right. And so that takes us to uh, the final learning objective. And then maybe we'll go back over some more detailed um, things from the book. We've got some extra time, but uh, some of you might be waiting for the new club site format. So if you've worked, have been in a book club before, you may have seen, um, this is what uh, book club sites look like. So it's a book down um, site. It is a package uh, that is meant for making books, not slides. And I've done some tweaks to make it look a little bit more like slides, but still not quite slides. Um, it's not awful, but I think the main problem with it is everyone wants to use Quarto now. Quarto exists and Quarto is not booked down. And so uh, let's see if we can change that. So this site, um, let's see if I can find the right tab. Yes, so this is the Web APIs with our book club site right now. Um, there's still a lot of things I want to do with the style, but uh, this is what it looks like. And um, the site itself, okay, it's just a normal website, but then if we, yes, that did work. So if we go to the slides, each set of slides is a Quarto slide deck and uh, you can do whatever you want. These are slide decks, like you can set them up. This one that I just clicked, I actually have not edited, I don't think at all, from what it was in the 
book down version. I just moved the slide and renamed it .qmd. Actually, I probably, I don't even, I don't think I even, yeah, I did rename it, I think, but I didn't edit it. I just renamed it to a QMD instead of RMD. So in theory, we should be able to switch uh, the clubs really easily. Um, I want to exit full screen to show here that one UI thing that I have worked out with these that I think is going to be nice is if you open slides and then I don't think this one works. Yeah, it doesn't work to go back, but the um, <laughs> so that that's not dem demoing what I want to demo. But OK, if we go so if we go here and we reopen the slides, it's going to the same tab each time. A little UI nicety to uh, avoid having 14 tabs of the same chapter. So if you go back to your index and you open a different chapter, how do I tell an API who, who I am? It always will go to that same tab. Um, so that's just, that's one little nice thing that I have done. Oh, that's that's right. This one I have edited, I think, because it has um, a header versus this one didn't have the header separated from learning objectives. It's the only difference. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically the new slate, uh, site format. Um, like I said, lots to do with the style, especially of this main page. Uh, the chapters aren't numbered automatically yet. I don't like in my book, that doesn't matter because the chapters don't really have numbers yet, but in other books that might make it a little hard to keep track of things. So that's something I need to fix. Then again, it doesn't necessarily have to be automatic because I can just like manually, you know, or I or other people in the club can do that manually once and then it's done usually. Um, but yeah, so once I've played around with this a little bit, um, we'll probably go in and go ahead and update other clubs. And that gives people a little bit more freedom to make the slides uh, look like slides. Uh, one thing that I keep trying to tell myself is it doesn't have to be perfect before I do the switch because the other site or the other way of doing the sites is not perfect. And so um, as long as it's close enough, uh, I will probably go ahead and start switching the sites over. Um, there is, oh, one asterisk on all of that that I'll have to deal with is uh, right now, all of the slide decks are actually connected to one another. So if you um, library a package in chapter one, that package is available in chapter 27. Um, and so some slide decks almost certainly will break because in the Quarto format, each slide deck is independent, which is better, really. Like you don't have, uh, there's there have been issues before where chapter seven and chapter 12 um, don't realize that one another exists and cause problems with one another. Uh, and so that won't happen anymore, but that, that'll that be a thing that we have to deal with. Um, and then I'm making sure that it's as easy as possible to edit slides. Um, at least as easy as it is right now. Uh, and then like um, the other other thing is a nice thing about Quarto is it's really fairly straightforward to cache uh, the um, like compiled version of the slide deck. But that's actually something I want to avoid for the book clubs because I don't want the book clubs to be teaching outdated code. So if that code no longer works, uh, it should fail <laughs> so that it has to be updated because otherwise you're teaching how things used to work. And that's, you know, you're teaching and learning um, how things used to work and that's not a good way to do things. So that's one thing I need to play around with a little bit, but uh, this is working, this club, like this is r4ds.io slash WAPIR. Um, that in the chat. And it's also on the slide there. Um, you can go there and load this. Uh, oh, and I didn't point out the other thing that's been on every slide is uh, Whopper.io, W-A-P-I-R.io. That's the actual book, but there's not much there because like I said, I'm running it backwards. So the book itself doesn't have a lot of content in it right now. It just kind of has a framework, um, but it will be there. That's where the book will be. Uh, it will be free online, just like all the ones that we use for R4DS, even though after it's published, you know, you can buy a print copy, but uh, frankly, it's, um, I am not looking at it as a money-making venture. It's a uh, way to make it available. And if I make a little bit of money off of it, cool, but I doubt that's going to happen. Um, 
All right. So yeah, that's the the book and the site. Um, what do people want to see next? Go ahead and speak up or chat. <laughs> Any thoughts? All right. Well, while people are uh, absorbing everything, oh, Federica has a comment. Uh, Federica likes the way I'm going to guess the new site looks, something like that, the new slides. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I like it, uh, the idea of starting off with a um, uh, book club and then populate nope. it in following, uh, uh, you know, your audience mm -hmm. request. And it, it's nice to, to have all for, for each chapter like a set of slides that uh, this color, I like it. <laughs> and so um, I, I think it's gonna be uh, very interesting. And uh, on top of this, it's useful. Uh, so yeah, I can't wait to, uh, to, to go it through. Okay, that's, that's great to hear. <laughs> that's what I wanna hear. Um, yeah, I know, like, I didn't get into a lot that is like actual actionable information in this particular talk today, um, it's because there's a lot <laughs> to do to get there. Uh, and I wanted to make sure to, you know, like I said, my, my objective is to get you to join that club. So I'm glad it sounds like I've gotten at least a couple of people and I will have to pull up that list after the meeting and see um, what we're looking at. Uh, like I said, obviously, we're not going to start until January. Uh, and so I'll figure that out um, after the break um, and we'll have to work out. Um, we won't be done probably before the daylight savings switch, which is my nemesis. Um, it's like a three week difference this year between the US and Europe. And so that's going to be fun. Um, oh, yeah. So. Um, so Kevin pointed out that uh, GPT is incredibly good at writing code to hit APIs given documentation, which is nice when wrappers don't exist. Um, yes, it tends to be pretty good. Um, obviously like, well, if you give it the documentation, yes. Um, something that I will be talking about in the book is uh, the surprising amount of time, even though that there are auto generators for API documentation, that still some often API documentation lies. Um, either it is lacking information um, about something that you know it describes, or it will have incorrect information. And fairly often it'll have missing information. And there's um, like a file behind the documentation that often has all of the information and then they just, maybe they haven't, it's kind of like in um, an R package, you have to actually hit document, you have to, to run the documentation command uh, when you're building a, or when you're writing a package. Um, I feel like a lot of APIs that are on the web, they have updated their specification of their API, but they haven't updated the actual documentation that goes along with it. So um, that is something that I'm gonna definitely be talking about but yeah for the like the main endpoints of uh an api and uh we'll talk about what an endpoint means <laughs> in the book but uh for the main things it tends to be pretty good and that's an example that i forgot to include but um the open ai api is uh definitely something that lots of people are interested in right now i will be definitely um including an example of that i want to be really careful because that is an API that is not free and that um, you are feeding by using it. <laughs> and so you have to be really careful about what data you're sending into that. Um, I do, I, they have some licensing about what they will use it for, but you're sending it to a company that's named Open API and explicitly does not share information about how they build their APIs or Open AI, not Open API, it's called Open AI but they are closed and they don't tell you how they build things. 
Um, so uh, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not saying anything that uh, someone could say sue for or whatever. I don't feel comfortable sending data into their their API even when they say that your data won't be used. Um, depending on, you know, you just have to be really careful about what the data is. Uh, but it, I know a lot of businesses are, and uh, that's going to lead some to some interesting lawsuits at some point in the future, I think. All right. Um, all right. So I think I will, since I've got another like 20 minutes, um, go and tell, talk about the very basics of um, accessing an H or an API from R. Um, the book is focusing on the hitter two package. Um, let me make sure that this is showing what I think it's showing. Yes. Um, so uh, I think I, or I, I kind of breezed over the idea, but so HTTR or hitter uh, is a package that has existed for quite a while for accessing APIs. It is um, what most people who have used R for a while would go to. And um, a couple years ago, at least, uh, and sorry, the original is by Hadley Wickham and this updated package, Hitter 2, is also by Hadley. And since so many packages wrap Hitter, but he really didn't like how it worked anymore, he made a brand new package that is uh, totally different uh, API, <laughs> meaning um, function interface than the old hitter. Uh, it's so much easier to use in my opinion. And so I focus exclusively on that in the book. At some point, I'll add a little uh, footnote talking about hitter or maybe a paragraph or something. But uh, if you are working with APIs, honestly, even if you're used to working with hitter, I recommend hitter too. It has a lot more safety built in. It has a lot more features. Um, and it's like easier to extend it, I think. So if you want to do some special things, it's better at that. So definitely I recommend Hitter 2. So in this chapter, um, I am hoping to get you to where you can describe how Hitter 2 calls are structured, where you'll be able to create and modify a Hitter request and um, access an HTTP API with Hitter 2. Um, this is the first of many chapters about that are basically about how to use hitter two. And so we're not going to get into every detail about how to do everything, including we don't get into authentication, which is one of the main things like you, you need the chapter after this to access most APIs, but this will get you started, especially for free open APIs. All right. So what is hitter two? Um, it is, I guess I need a bullet above this. Of, um, <laughs> This is no longer accurate. Uh, it says here we're working with the dev version, um, which will re be released soon as 1.0.0. That has happened. So um, this package is on CRAN. It's been on CRAN, but the version one is on CRAN. If you have worked with it before, update to one, version one. He fixed a whole lot. They added a lot. Um, the documentation is great. Uh, so highly recommend it. Um, but the general idea is it's pipe-based API calls. So if you've worked with the tidyverse, um, yeah. So yeah, if you've worked with API or worked with the tidyverse, um, you know the pipe is the base pipe. Um, the general idea in hitter two is you you make your request and then you perform it and then you take the response and parse it. Um, that's the very vague general idea, but it's like split up into these steps, these composable steps, and it just makes it uh, easier to understand the code. Um, all right, so let's look at an example. So this is from that AP, uh, OpenFEC API. Uh, a hitter example is, um, I don't, yeah, I haven't gone in here and um, quartoized these yet, so there isn't uh, highlighting, but general idea is um, we've got these candidates. Um, we start with a request. So that's the request function from hitter two, which is just the base URL. This is like where all of the API is structured off of. And then we can say, oh, headers, let's give it this API key. Um, this particular API has a key demo key that you can use 
to access the API that has some limits on it, but it works for almost anything. So we, we set up that header with that API key. And then we um, go into this rec uh, URL path append, which adds candidates onto the end of the URL. So we're saying, I want to go to the candidate send point. Um, and then you can say rec URL query. Um, we skipped the part of chapter one, two, where we talk about kind of what the difference is between these sections, but so query is like after the question mark in a URL. So we, we can say office equals H and office equals S and election years 2024. Um, and then there's this multi uh, parameter, which was added in hitter two version one um, explode, which this API describes in its documentation that um, this office parameter, it wants you to split that up into office equals H and office equals S. That's how send Senate, for example, um, versus some other APIs might want you to um, put those both in comma separated. So office equals H comma S. Um, so hitter two lets you specify how to deal with that. And then you just say, okay, perform it. So I built my request. That's this section builds the request. And then this actually performs the request. And the really nice thing about that, if you don't include this, um, there's also, there's rec dry run, which will show you like, uh, uh, if you run rec dry run, it tells you what's gonna happen basically. Um, or you can just leave everything up and just kind of see what it has built for the request. So it's this pipeable interface. Um, I probably, I really need to make this a slow reveal uh, to show the pieces of that, um, but that's the general idea. And then you'll do a rest body JSON um, and uh, get the response. So, and I'm sorry, you're not expected from this to understand every step of it. I'm just kind of going through it to give an example and then we'll go back through and dive in a little bit deeper. So, okay, so that rest body JSON, that last piece is taking the request that you just performed and pulling out the piece that you want, the JSON content. And the result of that is this candidate's object. And so this is just an example as of uh, whenever I built these slides that candidates, uh, the first result uh, candidate ID is H4OR05312, whatever. And so that, that has this whole object. I do have room on this slide, so I might print more of what that object is, but it's a big giant object. Um, so that's, that's hitting an API with hitter. Uh, now we will go through and see what all that those pieces mean, at least some of them in the next 15 minutes. All right. So again, um, this is the URL that we were building, like the, the actual request we were building is this uh, api.openfdc.gov slash v1 slash candidates. So that was that uh, candidates piece. And actually, we're going to see this in a second. Um, we're saying that we want this office equals H and office equals S and election years 2024. That's the base URL, the path and the query. So base URL, um, <laughs> I actually wrote it both ways here, but that uh, the base URL could either be looked at as just that or the way I specify it, it's everything comes off of this V1 piece of the path, but the, the V1 candidates is the, the path and then the query is everything after the question mark. So that. All right. Um, so the functions for this um, is that request, uh, HTTR2 request is where you set your base URL. Um, rec URL path append lets you add parts to that URL separated by slash. There's also rec URL path. Oh, and we're going to talk about that in the next slide a little bit. Um, rec URL query lets you add those query pieces. So again, that's that piece that we looked at and this is actually supposed to show result and it doesn't right now, but that result rec URL is this. All right. Uh, some other things that you can do with uh, queries, you can call um, this rec URL function to totally replace the entire URL. Uh, don't use that. Um, I. Uh, there are cases, I guess, where you would want to do that, but I, I would just always do that with, if you're gonna use the pure fully formed URL, just do it in quest. Um, rec URL path will take, like it'll replace everything after this first slash. So again, 
probably don't do that. Like you, you put that there for a reason. So you almost never want to use that one. Um, but rec template. So that one, this one's kind of neat. It will let you kind of just give it um, information of like, this is kind of a format that is often used in documentation of this get slash endpoint in curly braces. If you've worked with glue, it's that same format of using curly braces for variables. And that will uh, generate, um, again, I don't know why, oh, I, I, I must have, oh, I turned them off. That's right, because it was trying to hit the API and GitHub Actions was failing. So I need to put in the demos or the URL, the results. But this would be uh, this same API, but just through here. So that code is just generating that much with get slash endpoint and the endpoint is candidates. Um, just a little look at, there's, uh, like I said, this authentication piece, the request headers. Um, this is a demo of how to do it. And again, I was showing this before and I turned it off and haven't uh, rebuilt the slides because I wasn't planning to show them yet. But um, this rec headers lets you have this redact, uh, redact, I guess is the way you pronounce that, um, argument that all it does is when you print it, it just doesn't show it in the console. It doesn't actually print it. So you say, hey, I want to uh, redact the API key. Let's say you were loading this from an environment variable, which I'll talk about in chapter five or whatever chapter number that is right now. Um, that way it doesn't show in your code. It, it doesn't show like in your outputs um, if it's some secret. This isn't a secret. It's the public uh, open key of demo key, but um, that redact is nice. And we'll see a lot more of that in a later chapter. Um, the next piece is the method. So um, we skipped the part of the chapter that uh, talks about these, but, and so if we do the, if you do the book club, you'll get a little bit more of a deep dive into methods, but uh, get is like, um, mostly that's when you, whenever you read something online, uh, think like any web page you're going to is you're probably doing a get request. Um, so the um, automatically, if you don't have a body, in the request that you're building, it's hitter two is going to automatically do get. If you do have a body, it's going to do post, or you can use rec method to specify uh, the method. Again, that'll make a lot more sense when we do all of chapter two. Um, but you rarely need uh, the rec method piece. Some other pieces that are um, in here. There's rec proxy uh, to specify the the proxy of um, where you're doing the call from, I'm gonna blow, uh, blow on from here because we don't care about that. Um, but there's a lot more to come of uh, hitter two. So I have these chapter numbers here. These are not automated right now. And so they're probably incorrect already. Um, I haven't looked back to see if I updated these after doing some edits, but uh, that these and they might be accurate. Anyway, chapter one of the chapters, authentication for HTT or hitter two. Um, that's a big, big, big section. So if you've ever seen OAuth versus API keys versus there are a few other ones, but those are the main ones. Um, you can do auth and cookies. You, there are lots of different options for authentication. So the, I have a whole chapter about that. Um, chapter five is about parsing responses. So we had that rec body or resp body JSON um, to pull the actual data out of the response. So I have a whole chapter about uh, what is JSON, a uh, little bit about what is XML and what are some other options for bodies. Um, so that's chapter five. And then chapter six is, um, it. Uh, the title is something along the lines of like, how do I deal with uh, a lot of data from an API? Um, pagination is the main thing. There's uh, various strategies for um, requesting basically a page at a time. So if you're thinking like a web page, uh, where it'll show the first hundred results and you have to click something to see the next hundred. APIs often have something equivalent to that. And um, that's something that's in, it, it came late to uh, hitter two version one. Uh, they implemented a whole um, suite of functions for dealing with pagination um, really nicely. Uh, and so that is that gets its own chapter with some other things around it. I honestly can't remember what I put into that right now. 
So one thing I did notice, just like I hadn't re-prepared these to present to people. And so uh, this particular chapter needs a lot more in the slides as far as why. Um, but I'd kind of be interested to hear on this thing that I didn't look at again before presenting it of um, other thoughts. What do people, because this is, that's all I have in these slides. So uh, is there anything else that other than context that you would like to see here? Hey, John, um, I do, I, I haven't, I've gone through a little bit of, of your book and some of the, yeah. um, some of the outline of it. And I think the authentication piece is like super important because that is always, I've found to be a pain point anytime sure. that I try and write wrappers around API. So I think that's a, a very, very good point to cover. <laughs> um, I also think like, if, is there, I was going to ask you, is there going to be any section discussing like how to manage tokens and how to manage credentials? I mean, I know, I know we're not security experts, but I, right. I also see that as a, as something to discuss as well. Um, so I didn't know if you were going to go down that route or if that was something you're going to explore or not touch. Um, Cause that's something that I feel is also another pain point is where do I put this authentication right. data or this data? data that I need to authenticate securely, so. Um, I'll say yes, with uh, probably um, some really big caveats and asterisks and all that, but um, I, yeah, so I will, I, I will uh, get opinionated about that because you do need like everything tries to wave off. Well, I'm not a security expert, so I'm not gonna tell you anything. It's like, oh, you got to tell me something because uh, I can't use it otherwise. So, yes, I, I will talk a little bit about that. I'll say the um, one shortcut or piece of information that I learned that is useful is uh, refresh tokens are really what you should be saving, not tokens. So not the uh, the final like API key style token that you get out of OAuth 2. Um, it takes a little bit of work to make them work with hitter two still. And that's something that I like to kind of push to make a little bit easier, but um, really, because refresh tokens are meant to be long lived. They're the thing you use the refresh token to get a fresh token. Um, and the idea is that you can disable them and therefore, yeah, okay, they're long lived, but you can say, no, never mind, deauthorize that thing and it won't work anymore. Um, you can do that with the token too, but it's a uh, you know there's this whole multi-step process that they have. Also, uh, a thing I will definitely be going into in the auth. It took me a very long time to understand why is this process like it feels like it's um, just complicated. Like why is it complicated? Because it didn't. I couldn't see where the safety comes from in the complication and. A lot of times something being overcomplicated can make it less secure because, you know, okay, then I'll just write down every step, you know, and every, you know, I'll try to make it not happen as often as possible because it's overcomplicated. But there's, there is some um, explanation of that. And I will say the vignettes in Hitter 2, well, there's one vignette about OAuth that is really good. Um, but even then, like um, the, the API client, so there's the thing when you're when you create an API client, um, which number one, it's just confusing. What is the client and what is my app? And there's all these different vocabulary pieces, but they give you usually like a key and secret or token and secret. A key and secret, I think, are the most common names for it. And that secret is sometimes not really secret, and sometimes it is. And when is it actually a secret? Um, the hitter docs, hitter two docs, lean towards, oh, don't worry, that's not really a secret. But there are times when it is. And so um, I do want to go into that a little bit. Uh, spoiler alert, the one, the example I have is um, like a Slack uh, API client is the thing that you install into a Slack team. And so if someone has that secret, uh, they have access to the already installed client and they don't have to get you to trust that in order to get it installed in the Slack. And so basically if the client 
has some special permissions attached to it, then it's a secret. Most of the time, the client doesn't really have any special permissions. It might have an API, like a, a rate limit. And that, that's what people would try to steal from you. Um, but it doesn't have, you know, a lot of times it doesn't have even a rate limit. Like it's just your copy so that they can turn you off. Um, there's not a lot to lose. Like you might have to just make a new client at some point. Um, but yeah, so anyway, all of that stuff. Yes, I am going to talk about some of that. And it's... There's negotiation to, um, like, there's a dance <laughs> to, to make sure I'm not overselling. I am not a security expert, as everyone wants to say on that kind of thing. Um, but I'll, I'll t I hope to tell you enough. Like, we had a lot to do with that with uh, YouTube, YouTube Bar. Um, I overdid it at first, and I still I have some work to go through and. Uh, and delete some code basically because he implemented things to make it a little bit better in it or two. But there's still a whole, um, like chances are, if you're writing any code, you want to automate something and therefore you want to be able to save your authentication somehow so that you don't have to be at the computer every time the thing runs. And that is difficult um, because a lot of these things are built for interactive use. But, uh, you know, I guess. Right. The bright side to think about is um, like a half hour ago, uh, the process ran to check, are there any videos available to upload? And if there were, it downloaded them from Zoom and uploaded them to YouTube. And uh, if there were any that were ready on YouTube, it posted about it on Slack and all that ran while we were talking um, automatically. So I have done this. Um, it is doable. and. Uh, we will go into that for sure in uh, uh, the authentication chapter. Um, I had at one point a separate chapter about automation of Hitter 2. As I wrote things, I was like, no, I think I want to just include that as I go. Um, always be thinking, hey, you might want to automate this. So right now I don't think I have, um, yeah, I don't have a separate chapter about that right now. Uh, but we will see as we're talking, like if it, like this discussion of how to save credentials might not totally fit into the authentication chapter itself, for example. Um, so that's a good, um, that's a good question, and I will make sure that that is covered. Um, yeah, I think some really good examples. I, I'm sure you're familiar with like Gargle. Like yeah. Gargle has some really good vignettes about you know managing tokens securely and like if you're going to wrap you're going to use your package or use functions within your package to wrap gargle. I think there's some really good stuff in there, but yeah, it's a pain point. It's complicated stuff. And so there's some, that's going to be some hard work to translate that. Um, well, so, but. yeah. And part of like gargle is dealing with one specific API. I mean, it's a set of APIs, but whatever one um, service that has a way of that it does things. And so it can say, here is how this one works. And it's really hard to say generally how they work. I, again, though, have found that the um, the open API document, not to be confused with open AI, uh, the, the document of the API tends to have a lot clearer information about how authentication works than like, usually it's in the documentation somewhere, but it's not always in the same place. But in the documentate or in the spec of the API, it's always in the same place. And learning that has been huge for being able to figure out how the heck to work with the API. Because I can, if nothing else, I can find like keywords to search for in their documentation. Um, it's like, oh, I need this key. Where do I get that API key? And then you can find that within the documentation. So um, that's definitely like a huge part of the book is that authentication chapter, probably the most important chapter of the whole book, because it's the thing that like I have struggled with a lot. Um, that was actually one of my first fairly successful uh, uses of chat GPT was getting it to um, explain how OAuth 2 works. And it was wrong about some things, but it led me to the right uh, resources at least, or led me to the terms to look up. Um, and so, yeah, that is definitely a big piece of all this. Uh, 
Anything else like, you know, we'll have a, a lot more. And so something that will happen in the book club, that chapter was not ready uh, to present. I, I wasn't planning to go through it because I will be going through all of these a second time and go, ooh, this has no context to it. Uh, we definitely need context before we discuss it in the book club. And so um, that will be happening, but it probably won't be that much different than what we just went through in that it's not done. It, I know it's not, it's kind of a framework of um, here's what is, here's the general idea. What, what's too much, what's too little, what do you need more of? Um, what didn't make any sense? So uh, just to make sure I'm not overselling anything. Uh, John, this is a question. Yeah. Are you, are you going to be also talking about your, I forget the name of it, the mm. package generation package for APIs? Uh, so, um, uh, probably, well, there is, so there's a chapter about API packages, API wrapping packages. Um, that chapter will discuss some level of that project. Um, that project is so, uh, like it's got a long way to go still. And so I'm not sure. Like, I don't know how book ready it will be. Within the club, we'll talk about it, I'm sure, as things come up. So just to take the, um, you know, the confusion out of this. So uh, if you go to this, um, that is one of a series of packages that I'm working on for taking that document that I was talking about, the open API document and making a an R package for that API, automatically creating the first version basically, or the, the, the skeleton. Um, I am actively working on the most important section of that right now, which is the um, actually taking all of the uh, endpoints and generating functions, including documentation and all that. I've done it a couple of times um, semi-automatically, but there was a lot of manual work uh, within there and um, almost done with this section about the generating the functions. I did um, the first like API key authentication is done um, and the baseline of like just uh, setting up the the root of the, the calls is done. Um, so yeah, I'll be discussing that project within the book club to a degree. Um, one thing I am making as part of that is I have this package that I talked about earlier of, um, or actually, no, I didn't talk about it earlier, but any API, API is a package that wraps my package that wraps the APIs.guru site. And what its goal is, is you could use it to find a package or find an API and then generate um, functions kind of on the fly for accessing that API. Um, I'm not sure yet if that's going to work as well as I think it will, but um, if it works, then the idea is even if it's not in uh, the directory of APIs, you could kind of make a package uh, in the moment if you wanted to do access an API. Um, so yeah, that'll be something I talk about. I, I definitely going to talk about finding APIs, both finding um, the APIs and finding packages that already exist for uh, hitting APIs. Um, I, I'm i torn. I might move those chapters earlier because if a package already exists, you don't necessarily need to know how the API works, you know, like the, depending on how well the package is put together, it might explain everything. Um, and so if you were kind of looking through this table of contents, um, you know, oh, I want to work with YouTube. You probably shouldn't start with creating your own package because there are at least two out there <laughs> that wrap the YouTube API. So um, learning how to search for them is probably more important. Yeah, um, one other comment, um, as long as we're hanging out, I just, uh, yeah. like the when I look at the HTTR, or hit, sorry, the hitter to, yeah. uh, and now that I know how to pronounce it, um, the, 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 the package, like, I, I think it's really great for um, kind of layering in these different pieces of a request 
Um, but sometimes I worry that like it obfuscates what the underlying call actually is like, like how these different functions and layers map on to like a raw, you know, HTTP representation of that request, you know, like, yeah, um, I feel like sometimes like it's important to be able to like go back and see what the full thing is and what the whole, I mean, I think hitter hitter does allow you to do that, but, um, I don't know. Cause like sometimes there's like so much on the internet for like the raw form of the thing and getting help at that level. And then if like, it's hard to see the relationship between the two. Sometimes it makes it confusing, but so, um, I think, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I think the goal is definitely going to be for that not to be confusing, mm -hmm. at least to be as, as clear as it can be. Um, there's, there's always a balance. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's a, a leaky abstraction and um, I'll have to dig into um, the, the talk from posit count. Uh, JD Long's um, keynote about leaky abstractions, about being able to dig down that you know to the next layer when you need to, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it is it's always that fine line of how much to to abstract. Um, like part of the goal with Beekeeper and and friends is actually to get you a step further away from the. Um, the raw code of let you think in R and do as little as you can in the esoteric language of the API. Um, but yeah, that is that is a thing to be concerned about because if you don't understand, you know, let's just starting at the level of like if you don't know what the different methods are. Um, you know, hitter two automatically does gets for some things and posts for other things. And if you don't know how to tell it, no, wait, I need to do a put and you mm -hmm. don't know what a put is and when you might do a put, then uh, it can be like the documentation might kind of assume that you know those things. Um, and so um, definitely I'll be going into that information. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the the method was definitely actually that was like what I was thinking about when I made that. Oh, comment. good. Was like, yeah, well like, then, yeah, like good. kind of the implicit <laughs> implicit decision about like what kind of request it is, you know, and right. The so the implicit decisions it makes are um, very reasonable, and actually in um, in Beekeeper, I'm trying to remember how it's set up right now, I. I think, yeah, because um, because the documentation is always going to have, this is what you get when you do a get, and this is what you get when you do a post, or this one you can only do a patch or whatever. Um, when you generate it, uh, generate the functions, I don't let H, uh, hitter two automate any of that anymore. You know, it'll be like, no, this is get, it's explicitly get. Um, and so, yeah, <laughs> like I will be, um, we'll definitely talk about that, that abstraction, why it does what it does. And that works. Uh, like if you're not wrapping an entire API, if you're just using an API in kind of a normal way, um, you almost definitely want the automatic get or the automatic post that, that hitter two is going to do. Um, rarely you, you want to switch. And actually, the web is moving more towards, uh, uh, is it, I probably post. Yeah, it's going to be like all posts, um, with other things within the body are doing more of the specification of what's going on. Um, but yeah, anyway, that'll be in the book, <laughs> and all of a lot of that stuff that I was musing on and not really describing at the end there. It's stuff that I learned in uh, November, writing these notes of um, trying to get good def definitions of some things and then learning, oh, wow, there's all this, uh, uh, was it gRPC is a relatively new format that's kind of a competitor to HTTT, yeah, HTTR. Um, there's WebSockets, um, or sorry, it's a competitor to HTTP, which HTTR is 
uh, all about HTTP and really gRPC uses HTTP, but it, it's a special way of doing it. Anyway, um, <laughs> yes, so all that is to say, yep, <laughs> we will talk about that for sure. Uh, but it will, I don't know, it'll be good to hear uh, when we really go into these things of, um, did that make sense? Was that too, uh, almost yeah. was that too easy like is kind of a thing like did, did that brush freeze over it so much that you don't actually understand it like you know how to do it but you don't understand it um that'll be something to watch out for mm -hmm. yeah and the last thing i was just gonna say just looking at your chapters also is like it makes me wonder if like is like something like like the kind of app like system level considerations for with apis is that something you're thinking about like touching on like like if you're making your own API, it's in the context sometimes of like like splitting up functionality and you know like that kind of idea. Um, yeah, for so, others to like use and you know and for it to abstract away your own application and you know those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do have a little bit in that first like plumber chapter. How can I create? an API about a little bit of, around kind of like philosophy. Um, but I, I, I'm i going to be leaning a lot on recommending a couple of books about that because when you're really designing like a full API, if you are going to design a full API, I'm not going to cover that. Like that's a whole, there are yeah, many, yeah. many, many books on that sub subject. Uh, there are a couple that I like. Um, but I will cover kind of the baseline of how to think, um, how you know, thinking a little bit at least about how to split things up in reasonable ways. The um, shortest version of that that um, I think I'm going to be leaning into a lot is uh, that in REST, um, your endpoints are supposed to be nouns. They are the objects that you're acting on. And then the methods describe what you are doing with that object and the arguments help to describe what you're doing with that object. And so if you really embrace that way of thinking about things, I think it does make for a lot cleaner APIs. Um, and so, you know, get user uh, is getting information about a user, post user is creating a user, um, delete user is deleting a user, uh, et cetera. So like thinking in the method plus, uh, you know, method is not as verb and endpoint is noun, I think helps a lot. Um, and I will be talking a bit about that. <laughs> and then talking about how there's kind of a push away from that idea a little bit right now. Um, I don't know how much I'll go into that, but we, when we go into uh, chapter three in the club, I'll be trying to get a lot of feedback on, hey, I discovered all these other things that are kind of weird but emerging ways to deal with APIs. Um, how much do we want to talk about them? They all have um, at least one R package to deal with them, but they aren't necessarily super well developed. Um, and so anyway, we'll talk about those those things. Learned all about WebSockets, which is neat, but uh, a whole other level of things. Um, that's the two-way communication API. So technically Shiny is built on top of WebSockets because the server and the Shiny app have two-way communication going on. Um, or uh, Slack has a WebSockets API where every time someone posts a message, your R process can be receiving that message. Um, and then like you could do something with that re reception and it can go back and forth. Chat apps uh, use WebSockets. So there's that whole other way of doing things um, that, I don't know. We'll see how much we talk about it, or I talk about it in the book, but then also I, I just want to play with it a bit to understand it better use case wise, because I suspect like the um, the uh, mentor dashboard, mentor dash that I built for R4DS would probably be a lot better if I used WebSockets instead of uh, the standard REST API. And I didn't even know that was a thing until I was writing the chapter about it. So, yes. Um, 
I don't know where I started on that tangent. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Any other thoughts? I mean, you know, we're obviously well over time, but I am happy to keep talking if people have anything else. So yeah. So when will we start the book club? Um, I plan to not think about it a lot until January 2nd. And then we'll see um, probably pretty quickly after that we'll want to start. So I definitely, you know, would like people to put in times when they think they could meet. I think uh, you weren't here yet. Maybe Kevin, when I can't remember if you were, but whatever, if anyone wasn't here, uh, the app right now won't necessarily show you other people's times. Um, but, you know, if you're watching this video, by the time you're watching the video, hopefully it will show you other people's times. And eventually it does. It's just a caching issue, which is uh, one of the two hard problems in computer programming, uh, cache and validation and naming things. I've got the naming things done down on Book Clubber, I think, but cache and validation is hard. Um, and so hopefully I'll have that fixed. Uh, right now it's like time or I have to refresh the, uh, like reload the app every once in a while from shiny app side. And I, I don't need to do that. I just have a typo somewhere, I think, because I have a whole should be functional ca cache and validation <laughs> system set up, but it's missing a step. Um, so like, if you go to look at the app, um, it should show you dark, like uh, the darkness of the green on the cell tells you how many other people have signed up for that time. It's better to sign up for times that are dark green because, um, you know, if you can make those work, that's great. But right now, just focus on your own availability and don't trust that the darkness of the green means anything because it could be, uh, you know, 10 people might have signed up since that refreshed and therefore you won't be seeing everyone's data. Um, on the bright side, the app loads a lot faster than it used to <laughs> because it's not reloading the data every time. Um, but it sometimes doesn't reload the data when it should be reloading the data, unfortunately. All right. Well, with that, uh, the channel does exist, uh, uh, book club, W-A-P-I-R. So I'll link to that in the project club channel. I'll link to all these things in the project club channel, um, also on the YouTube video. Uh, so yeah, join that channel. Um, it has existed for a while actually. And I just like dropped some things in there every once in a while as I was writing the slides, but now that will become a book club, um, channel like we're gonna really make a book club out of this and i i really uh am looking forward to doing this as a book club like it like i said it's gonna be weird i i plan to present every chapter although as we go it might be interesting for me to let other people drive my slide decks and tell me what makes no sense in the slide decks maybe we'll do that we'll see um but that you know like i said it'll be a way to kind of learn what people care about um and hopefully result in a good book <laughs> so um and if like i said the book is kind of a um it's like my personal notes combined with uh uh slide decks for workshops <laughs> and then oh yeah i'm also going to publish it as a book but that's what that's for really is for me to um kind of have a framework and and it, it came about because just I had multiple contracts I was working on plus R4DS that I was just doing API stuff. And I was like, oh, I guess that's what I do. <laughs> so let's let's double down on that. I got a grant from the R Consortium for that beekeeper project. And I uh, got a contract from CRC for this book. So, okay. <laughs> All right, I will see everybody on Slack. Thank you so much. <laughs>